here, there's a case of somebody who's had a cardiac arrest. What you see, those squiggly lines are brain activities and EEG. And what you find is that because of a lack of blood flow to the brain, electrical activity in the brain stops. So you get a flat line state in the brain. And the reason is, here's a case of somebody who had an EEG connected to them. And you can see as their heart rate's going from 85 to 48, their blood pressure dropped. And even before their heart completely stopped, their brain went into a flat line state. And this flat line state continues throughout the period of resuscitation. So when we do chest compressions, when we give drugs, when we shock the person, no matter what we do, this state continues because we're not able to get enough blood flowing back into the brain. And there's a lot of literature, this is well known. If anyone studies you know, brain physiology during cardiac arrest, you'll find there's a ton of literature on this out there. But just in summary, you'll have to just accept that from me, that there's no activity of the brain that we can measure. And this continues for up to an hour or two after the heart's been restarted. So there's a, as soon as the heart stops, within 10 seconds, brain function, as far as we can measure, stops, continues throughout resuscitation. If we get the person back to life, even for an hour or two afterwards, it may not function. So one of the questions is, how do people have awareness or consciousness? Now, we know that people have memories, a so-called near-death experience. Most of what they describe is very subjective. They'll describe seeing a tunnel, they may describe seeing a light, they may describe a sensation of going to a very beautiful place, they may describe an instantaneous panoramic review of their lives. They may describe seeing deceased relatives or seeing a very beautiful, perfect being that helps them through this process. And it's, but it's very personal. And we can't really tell whether these are real or not. And some people claim that this indicates the afterlife. I certainly don't, and I don't know what it means, except to say that it's, it's something that people seem to go through when they die. But there are a group of people who describe a sensation of going to the ceiling and being able to watch doctors and nurses working on them. And um, they seem to describe in incredible detail what had happened to them when all our science tells us that there is no, there's a flat line state in the brain during that time. So uh, Dr. LaRover, who we've invited tonight, actually had a case of a patient, a 14, 13 year old child, who essentially was having, I think, 45 minutes or an hour of cardiac arrest or more that you were reviving. And, she came back two months later and told them in detail what they had said, even I think some rude things that the nurses had said, I believe. But it's incredible because this is going on when you have a flatline state. This shouldn't happen. We have no scientific explanation for it. And so if this is real, this becomes very significant because it suggests that maybe the views of people like Plato may be correct. Maybe the mind and consciousness may be a separate undiscovered scientific entity that can continue to function when your brain isn't working. And the reason why we're very interested in this is because this is the only time where we can potentially separate mind and brain from each other and see. So if you do an experiment and you can demonstrate that when people have all gone through cardiac arrest, their brain isn't functioning at all, and their mind also completely shuts down, then that will support the view of people like Aristotle or a lot of the current modern neuroscientists. If, on the other hand, you demonstrate that these experiences are real, people can really see from above, then it would support the view that mind and consciousness may be separate. And so this is why we set up this study called the AWARE study, which is looking at, essentially, it's an international study being done here in the UK and in the United States and also in a few other countries in Europe that are coming on board. And we're trying to study in a large scale over 1,500 cases of people who've essentially had a cardiac arrest to see if these claims of seeing things from above are real or not. If we get, say, 500 people who we can demonstrate do not see things from above, then that would support the view that the mind and consciousness must be produced from brain electrical, some kind of process in the brain. So the monist views must be correct. If, on the other hand, we can demonstrate that their claims are correct, that they really do see, so like the anecdote that Dr. LaRova had, if that's correct, then that means that mind and consciousness may be a separate, undiscovered scientific entity that isn't produced from the brain. So what we do is this, and you may have heard about this in the news, I don't know, we put up images that are only visible from the ceiling. And the idea is very simple. Here's one of my colleagues, Nikki Fallowfield, who works at Southampton with me. Um, this is the coronary care unit. And as you can see, towards the top of the picture, you have this shelf. And on one side of the shelf, there's a triangle. So we'll forget about that for a moment. But on the reverse side, there are various pictures that are only visible from the ceiling, as you can, as you can see. You can't see it from below. So it could be, say, a picture of a pink dog or a baby. And if we get, say, 500 people who all claim to have seen things from above, and none of them can identify these pictures, then it would support the idea that this was just some kind of trick of the mind. 
like I explained earlier. If, on the other hand, they all come back and they correctly identify these, then I think it becomes very, very significant. So this is the study that we're doing currently. And um, it was developed through this entity called the Human Consciousness Project, which is, which is essentially a multidisciplinary approach to studying the nature of human mind and consciousness. We have a number of colleagues from different centers in the world who are interested in this, and um, we're working together to do... This is the first experiment that we're doing in this area. And so I'm going to finish here and just leave you with a... There's a cute picture of some of our cousins, my cousins, I should say, forgive me. So I'm going to, again, leave you with this question. The human mind and consciousness is really unique if you think about it, compared to our closest, my closest cousins, the primates. Genetically, we're very similar. You know, our brain is not that different. Yet, what is it that makes us so unique? And I don't have the answers, of course, and I hope we might get some answers through our panel discussion tonight. So if I may, I'm just going to ask Peter, who's got some very interesting slides to show us about the whole subject of neuroscience for about 10 minutes, and then we'll go on to our panel discussion. <laughs>